So last time we saw a simple example of how to apply Farkas lemma to translate a universally quantified quadratic constraint into a linear constraint that can be handled by integer linear programming. So now we're going to return to our original simple example of locality optimization and show that uh, the Farkas lemma method actually applies to the more complicated uh, universally quantified constraint in our example. So back to our more realistic example, the constraint in question is the constraint that in our optimization problem, all of the data dependencies in the original program are respected. And it has a much more complicated form than the very simple example we looked at last video. Um, but Farkas Lemma actually still applies. And let me just reorganize things to show you. So first, let's reorganize to isolate quantified variables. So i and j are our quantified variables, and then sp, dp, sc, and dc are our um, uh, non-quantified variables or our decision variables. So if we just uh, reorganize things a little bit, we can rewrite this whole expression as minus sp times i plus sc times j plus and then in parentheses dc minus dp. Now this is actually an affine expression in the quantified variables i and j um, if uh, you think of these guys as constants that we're going to select. So what we've done here is we've basically created um, an affine form, which is minus sp sc as a vector dot with ij as a vector plus this constant dc minus dp is greater than or equal to zero. So the constraint part uh, fits Farkas lemma. We have an affine form and the constraint that the affine form is greater than or equal to zero and we have a universal quantifier. And then crucially, the domain of this quantifier is a polyhedron. So this looks a little odd, but if we just normalize the constraints, so we kind of blow them all out so that we have one uh, comparator in each constraint expression, and then we just reorganize them a little bit, what we can see is that actually this is a set of uh, linear inequalities. This is basically a matrix A times I comma J, or the vector IJ is greater, plus B is greater than or equal to zero. Um, and so what we have in this, uh, this formula is for all i and j in vectors ij in a polyhedron, the vector minus spsc dotted with ij plus a constant is greater than or equal to zero. So in fact, this is a constraint of the form for all uh, variables in a polyhedron, an affine form over that polyhedron is greater than or equal to zero, and we can apply Farkas lambda to it. Um, to reduce this to a set of ILP constraints. Though it'd be very long because we'd have lots of lambdas, right? We'd have one lambda for each constraint plus a lambda for the constant. So I'm not gonna write that out in this whole, uh, on a single PowerPoint slide in this font, but uh, it could be done. Like you hopefully you could see that this formula can be applied. And in fact, the Fargus lemma trick helps with the objective function too, right? So once we see this pattern of being able to apply Fargus lemma to universally quantified constraints, we can actually create new universally quantified constraints with fresh variables that represent interesting properties like locality and parallelism in the schedule. So let's look at how we could capture the locality in the schedules um, in the objective function by using this Fargus lemma trick. Well, here's one way to do it. We're going to create a fresh variable that represents a bound on the time between producer and consumer executions. So what we're going to do is we're going to add this extra constraint, and I'm putting that in air quotes even though you can't see me, and it's going to be almost of the same form as our dependence constraint. So we have our constraint which says all the data dependencies have to be respected, which means the time at which i is produced must be less than or equal to the time when j is produced if statement i sends data to statement j. Now we're going to add a new one, new constraint which says for all values of i and j where statement i sends data to statement j, w, which is this fresh variable, bounds the difference between the time when i and j happen. And actually, I might have reversed the order here. I would have to think about it. But uh, basically, what we're trying to say here is this new w is actually what's called a uniform bound on the time between production and consumption of values. And so w, intuitively, when we hit solve, right, when we convert all these universally quantified constraints into integer constraints and we minimize w, w is going to be the longest time between the production of a value and its consumption. And so actually, as w gets smaller, the locality in the schedule gets better. And so in a sense, w is capturing... Um, how much locality there is in our calculated schedule. So we'd apply Fargus lemma to each of these universally quantified constraints, because again, it's actually a positivity constraint or a non-negativity constraint on an affine form. And uh, we would solve it using ILP and get an answer. 
In fact, in general, we might want something a little bit more sophisticated uh, as an ILP encoding for locality, but I'm not going to belabor this point. There's, there's more complex and more sophisticated ways to encode uh, the locality of a schedule using this kind of constraint, but uh, you, know, you can read about those in papers, and I'm not going to go over them in great detail. Um, the other thing is we can actually use a similar strategy to push dependencies further apart to create parallelism. So in the same way that we can create fresh variables that represent uh, the time from production to consumption of values and minimize them to reduce the time from production to consumption of values, we can also create variables that represent the difference between production and consumption time of values and force that variable to be larger or try to maximize it in order to push dependencies apart and uh, create parallelism. So for example, we might say maximize E, where E is a fresh variable and E is a lower bound on the difference between uh, the production and consumption times. And then so that E isn't infinity and we get something tractable, we can say uh, create some number like you know, zero, you know, one or 20 or some upper bound on the number of loop iterations in the new schedule between production and consumption of values. And actually, it's not exactly this, but something very similar to this kind of formulation is used in what's called a Foutre's algorithm, which is a classic polyhedral scheduling algorithm, where you basically try to, at each step, iteratively um, maximize the number of statements that have a dependency that are assigned to different outer loop iterations. And multiple dimensions can be handled iteratively. So here we're looking at a one-dimensional example of how to schedule. And typically, when you have um, you know, multi-dimensional schedules where you want to create uh, loop nests with multiple levels, um, you compute the loopness from the outermost level to the innermost level. So basically you initialize your data dependence graph and then you create a scheduling problem that corresponds to computing the schedule at the outermost loop level. And once you've found that schedule, you check for dependencies in the dependence graph that are carried or satisfied by the outer loop. So where basically the producer statement is in an earlier outer loop iteration than the consumer and you prune all of those dependencies and then you set up a new problem and you basic uh, resolve it for the next innermost loop level and so on. And so it looks something like this, right? You would basically, and things like uh, Foutre's algorithm and Pluto basically follow this template. You initialize, or the ISL scheduler, you initialize a data dependence graph and you set your set of schedule vectors to be empty. And then while your dependence graph is not empty, you solve an ILP that uh, optimizes some objective that you want to improve, like locality or parallelism, over your dependence graph, and you append the schedules you computed, which represent the next uh, level of loops in the loop nests, to your schedule vectors. Um, and then you delete any carried dependencies from uh, the dependence graph based on uh, the uh, schedule you just computed. So that's the sort of a very broad outline of how polyhedral scheduling works. You use um, uh, this sort of encoding method yeah, that relies on Farkas lemma to turn the universally quantified constraints that represent things like data dependencies, locality, and parallelism into ILP constraints. And then you set up an objective function that represents something about the properties um, of the program that you want to optimize. And you run it uh, basically over and over again, constructing uh, levels of the loop from the outermost to the innermost. So once we've gotten our polyhedral schedule, it's actually just a giant list of affine functions that map our statements in your original program to times. So how do we actually turn something like that back into for loops? Well, that's its own very difficult and interesting topic, and it's something that we'll talk about in the next video.